people, the maybe others have forgotten who I apologise, but I want to say thank you to Carol Phillips especially, as well as to George Roberts, Barbara Phillips, Mandy Smith, Candice Smith, Dave Osu, Arthur Torrington, Steve Aldo, Ivan Stacks, Alan Williams, Mark Christian, Ramon Sugar Dean, George Dixon, Derek Murray, Val Wilmer, Hudson Phillips, Harun Shah, Bob Seppikin, David Bedford, and Wes Paul. Those people, in allowing me to interview them or correspond with them, uh, have provided me with the substance of much of my research. Um, I dedicate this talk to them. So, to begin this by talking, I want to combine a narrative of Lord Woodbine's life with a narrative of how the history has been told and sometimes mistold. So I want to begin in the 1980s. Uh, there is a photograph of Harold Phillips, Lord Woodbine, taken sometime, I think, in the early 1980s. Now, a lot of, uh, a lot of this narrative takes the form of oral history. What I want to show you first is an early example of this history being told. Ferdinand Dennis, um, a Jamaican researcher, um, produced a book called Behind the Front Lines in 1988, which he interviewed uh, various people uh, to discuss black experiences of living and working in the UK. This is an extract from an interview. So, uh, Ferdinand Dennis was speaking to, uh, to a gentleman in Toxteth. Dennis asked about the Beatles. This was the reply. The Beatles? We've got no time for the Beatles around here. They're just another example of the white music industry ripping off black music. Where do you think the Beatles learned their craft? They come from up Penny Lane way. There are no nightclubs up there. They learned it around here in Liverpool Lakes, also known as Toxteth. John and Paul were taught to play the guitar by a Trinidadian guy, Woodvine. So there's an example of the sort of the oral history element and how things can sometimes get literally misheard. I don't know whether the person being interviewed himself thought that the name was Woodvine or whether the interviewer misheard it. But anyway, it's fairly clear who has been spoken about. Woodvine, or Lord Woodvine, used to own a nightclub that played stateside music. He was a musician himself. John and Paul used to hang around him. That's where they picked up their style from. Nobody ever mentions Woodbine. Nobody. That was said in the mid-1980s. There is uh, an additional statement that was made. Um, so the author, Ferdinand Dennis, I told him I was unaware of the Beatles' top of the connection. Someone else responds, that's the way they, white people, want it, said Shaw. Scratch most white surfaces and you'll find an exploited black man below the surface. So this deeply problematic um, pattern of um, marginalisation and attempts at silence. That's a pattern that does um, recur through most of the research that most of what I've learned about Lord Woodbine and his story. That pattern, unfortunately, is there. But I do think this is changing. Um, I need to be a bit discreet here, but I'm aware that at present there is uh, one author, in, two authors in America, uh, one in the UK and one in Australia uh, researching the life of Lord Woodbine. Something else that uh, is, uh, is important to talk about here <coughs> is that Lord Woodbine was not the only black musician in Liverpool to act as a kind of mentor to the Beatles. Something that seems to have happened along the way is that uh, because he was the best known of uh, black Liverpool musicians associated with him, <coughs> I think sometimes people might have assumed that when one musician was being spoken of, it was actually Lord Woodbine they were referring to. 
But as I've shown with some later quotes, that might not always be the case. Nevertheless, um, Lord O'Brien was a massively important figure in the early Beatles story. He didn't rate them as musicians. Uh, it was in around 1958 that he, uh, he and other members of uh, the Steel Band he was part of, the Old Caribbean Steel Band, began to notice uh, these two um, these two young white men dressed a bit like teddy boys, who turned out to be uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. So, first of all, let's just see a bit more about Lord Cobain's early life. Um, so he was born in Lavendale in 1929. Uh, some sources say 28, but I have seen his birth certificate, as far as research. 20, 1929. He joined the RAF uh, in, uh, in 1943 at the age of 14, so considerably underage. How he managed to pull that off was that he, um, he enrolled using his older brother's passport. <laughs> One of the reasons why uh, he, uh, he said he, joined, he wanted to join the RAF was that there were few foreseeable opportunities for uh, the young man in, in Trinidad. Um, so he was based in Burtonwood in Lancashire. His connections with the North West were there quite early. He was based in the RAF in Burtonwood, Lancashire. 1947, <coughs> returned to Trinidad. And at that time, or at least by that time, he had begun writing and performing Calypso. Uh, in 1947, he, uh, he also toured with uh, <coughs> Kitchener in Jamaica. I'm, I've not yet been able to find out any more detail about that, but perhaps some people here know more. Um, 1948, on the first uh, voyage of uh, the Windrush, World War I arrived in London and stayed at Clapham, Clapham South <coughs> Deep Shelter. <coughs> this is where the various migrants stayed for several weeks in, while, while finding more stable accommodation. The gentleman on the left, standing, is the young Harold Phillips, aged around, uh, aged around 19, yeah. So uh, my thanks to uh, Arthur Torrington for providing <coughs> that photograph. I don't actually know who the photographer was. Um, let's just see a bit more about his musical background. So, um, one important thing to, uh, to clarify here is that owing to the extremely sad circumstances of Lord Wilbine's death in 2000, he died in a, a house fire along with his wife. Um, there are very, very few artifacts or possessions of Carl Phillips that have survived. That means that there are no known recordings of his songs, although I am aware that in the early 60s, when performing the steel bands, he did have access to tape recorders. That doesn't necessarily mean that recordings were made. 1947, uh, he was performing Calypso in Lavendale. He said that he wanted to, someone used the phrase this morning, uh, oral newspaper. And uh, the, the way he spoke about this in a later interview, he said that in a particularly impoverished area where he was based, people couldn't afford newspapers. He would improvise and, and write Calypso uh, in response to current events, uh, especially local events. 1947, toured Jamaica with Lord Kitchener. 48 to 52, he uh, led and toured with uh, two bands, Lord Woodbine and his Trinidadians. Um, before he, uh, left, he left Clapham uh, and then worked in Shropshire as a machinist in Wellington. Around that time, he formed a band called Lord Woodbine and his Trinidadians. Uh, Woodbine led the band singing in Calypso. During this period, he, he met his wife, uh, the woman who would become his wife, Helen Gora. And Helen uh, then joined the band as the vocalist. She, was, uh, she sang jazz songs, and uh, it was renamed the band Prima Trinidad. 1955, the All Caribbean Steel Band, which occasionally featured Winston Spree Simon, who was uh, working in Liverpool, performing in Liverpool at various points in the 50s and 60s, 
the old Caribbean steel band or is it the old steel Caribbean band? Um, there are references to both. It might be that only one of them is correct. I, I, I don't know, but looking at the oldest sources I can find, it, it, it's still sometimes all Caribbean steel band, sometimes all steel Caribbean band. 1958, he becomes involved with the young Beatles. So let's just pause and reflect on this for a moment, because as I say, when you see Lord Woodbine mentioned in narratives of the Beatles, it's yeah, he was a friend of theirs. He promoted a few gigs, he gave them a few bookings. Um, but what about this kind of musical background? Surely that is quite important, you know? 1958, he was playing in a club called uh, the Joker's Club in Liverpool, and uh, that's where he, was, uh, where he first encountered the young John Lennon and Paul McCartney. A year earlier, Lennon had written his first song, Especially, he specifies this in later interviews, his first song. It was called Calypso Rock. That's from 1957. Uh, that, that appears to have been before he did actually meet Woodbine. Can't be certain that, but it looks like that was before he met Woodbine. But if you just read the song called Calypso Rock, and if in the British and American music press there's a lot of talk about Calypso being uh, a new direction for popular music, it kind of makes sense that somebody such as Lord Woodbine would have been of considerable intrigue to, uh, to the young Lennon McCartney. I'll say more about the, uh, the Beatles later in a moment, but uh, just for a bit more background, uh, 1960 to 1963 uh, performed in Hamburg. Um, on the Beatles' first night playing in Hamburg, um, he took the stage first, and Woodbine sang some Calypso. Uh, he returned there in 1963, where he uh, performed a calypso in Hamburg that actually managed to get him deported. So, 1963, uh, the Nazis still an uh, illegal topic for satire <coughs> in public. Lord Woodby sang a calypso titled Hitler Rode into Berlin on the Back of a Donkey. <laughs> 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 the authorities threatened Just my cup of tea. The authorities threatened him with the rest, but gave him plane tickets and said, Right, you've got to leave Germany. Uh, he uh, apparently sold the plane tickets and managed to stay in Hamburg for a little longer, but came back before which much more time passed in order to uh, tell the story. So uh, he continued performing on occasion in, uh, through the 60s, up until around 1980. He would often be performing Calypso in Liverpool clubs. Now, in addition to these things, as, as Haroon said in the introduction, Woodbine or Phillips worked as uh, a railway engineer, he mended clocks, he taught carpentry to local youngsters, uh, he ran a second hand shop for many years in Liverpool Lakes. He, uh, he worked as a builder and decorator. So it never seems to reach a situation where he was able to earn his living solely through music. Um, unlike Lord Kitchener, for example, who was a friend of Phillips, um, based in Liverpool, there were fewer opportunities for recording artists. It may have been, I don't know, it may have been that he didn't want to become a famous musician. It was simply done for the love of it. Certainly, he was always very generous in promoting other musicians. Now, um, I want to...